This is Lecture 9 in Introduction to Politics. The first lecture in the series, I looked at four aspects of politics or those interested in political science. One is political ideology, political philosophy, political theory. The other is Canadian politics. The third is comparative politics and the fourth international relations. We've lingered thus far mostly in the area of political philosophy, touched on elements of Canadian politics, and what I'd like to do with the next couple lectures is look at comparative politics. Now we live in North America, inevitably this lecture will be called Widening the Circle, or the Larger Mountain, in which we think politics. Given the fact we live in Canada, and we're on the border of probably one of the most powerful states in world history, certainly since World War II, the United States, and since last year with the election in the United States and Trump being defeated by Biden and Harris, but in February, the impeach, second impeachment of Trump, Canadians tend to be drawn into that gravitational field of American politics. And so sometimes when we think comparative politics, it's comparing, at least in principle, if not in historic events, of the Canadian political system, and drawing more explicitly from the British Westminster tradition, is different from the American political system. And it is different structurally in significant ways, but both in their different ways have tried to embody a liberal democratic tradition. But this is North America. There is Mexico to the south of us, there is Central America, there is Latin America. So the Americas itself as an area of comparative politics, when people think different political systems, are the Central American states of El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, why is Costa Rica a bit of a haven for many in North America wanting to go south? sit under the blue sky. And then the Latin American countries, Brazil, Venezuela, certainly the last few years, and the clashes of Venezuela with this left of center government with elements of the United States. So the Americas is one region of the world, someone who's thinking comparative politics. How are these political systems, one, very much influenced by a Spanish tradition, as Certainly in the 16th century, as European powers were coming westward, the north was primarily shaped, particularly Canada, by an English-French tradition. The United States, dominantly by a Puritan English tradition, with further south, obviously, the Spanish tradition, so the southern states, and then Mexico, Latin America, and obviously South America. There were obviously First Nations or Indigenous peoples in Latin America as well. And much of the discussion that is going on there is the Maya, the Aztec, and many other Aboriginal people and the relationship of they to the Spanish people who are coming from Spain and Portugal, part of the colonizing process. So when we think comparative politics, there is the Americas. If we go across the ocean then, we're into Europe. How is the European system different politically? Scandinavian countries, Germany, Holland, as you go further south to Spain, Italy, how are they different politically? How are they different structurally than, say, North America? Why, for example, in North America are we still stuck in first-past-the-post voting patterns where when you go to Europe, variations of proportional representation are not only considered, but are a part of their political culture and ethos. Why in North America, even though in Canada we have a universal health care system, they don't in the United States, but when you go into certain states in Europe, is there free education as well as free universal health care? Yes, the taxes are higher, but the whole means of distributing and, and opening up possibilities for education and health care and many other things are a very different political system entirely. Again, coming out of a liberal democratic tradition, the European tradition uh, is quite different in how it understands 
how that's to work out structurally, organizationally, and then how it's played out in people's everyday lives. Now, Canada's caught between that American right of center political tradition, but we still more or less are tied to the Anglo European tradition with a greater sense of social consciousness, the role in the state, higher taxes for providing goods for citizens. And so within this largely speaking Euro British North American tradition, these are areas of comparative politics that can be examined for those who are interested in going down that path. But step out of that Euro British North American Central Latin American and journey into the Middle East. If we were to look at Saudi Arabia, how is its political system in comparative politics so different from the European American tradition? What are the roots of that given its Sunni Islamic tradition and obviously voting and treatment of women and immigrants and migrants and many of these very, very different. And to compare Saudi Arabia, for example, to Iran with the Shiite um, a tradition largely that replaced uh, the Shah. 1953 to 1979, the Shah family, the Shia tradition is quite different from the Sunni tradition. So between Iran and Saudi Arabia, very different political systems within the Islamic world itself. Indonesia is the biggest Muslim state in the world, but it itself is very, very different in terms of politics as well. And so here you have Muslim states, uh, Shia and Sunni, and yet the biggest political Muslim state, Indonesia, is quite, quite different from Saudi Arabia and Iran. And then you have Israel, which is often seen as the leading liberal democratic state in the Middle East. Is it? And how is it a liberal democratic? And is it really the only liberal democratic state? Whereas Jordan fit into that, for example, many people will argue that Jordan itself is liberal and democratic in a way that Israel and its treatment of the Palestinians is not. If we move then to Middle Eastern politics, we have very, very different political systems, even comparatively speaking within the Middle East itself. And then you break that down, compare it to Euro-American politics that's a very different uh, approach to things entirely. China, biggest population in the world, or even India, for example, that sees itself as the largest liberal de or democratic state in the world. How is it similar and different to countries that see themselves as committed to a democratic tradition? What would be the difference between India and um, the United States and Canada? It, it's structurally and how it it operates. Now China is so different of course in the USSR uh, from one another and from generally speaking a Euro-American tradition. Comparative politics once again. We look at some of the Asian countries like Singapore, South Korea and even North Korea. How is North and South Korea different? Comparative politics. So when we think these larger issues of comparative politics, are we going to compare politics within liberal democratic traditions or compare them to different regions of the world? And Africa obviously is a substantive area. The multiple states post-colonial era or after World War II, some are more stable in Africa. Many states are not as stable. Sudan, for example, is torn between Arab, Muslim, Christian, the North and South, South Africa since apartheid continues to feel its way and the tensions that exist in South Africa as it in principle uh, sees itself and certainly since Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Island an attempt to be a democratic tradition but the tensions which are existing there, given the apartheid history. Many other states, uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, Liberia, in the United, in, the, in, in Africa. So comparative politics, it can be broken down into different ways. There's one major regions of the world, and that, and you can compare states within those regions. So Africa, the Americas, the Middle East, 
Asia. Um, but then you can also compare these different po political systems to democratic traditions and those which in principle are suspicious of democratic systems themselves, some inspired by religion, some not inspired by religion. And so comparative politics, voting patterns where people can vote, where people can't vote, who's allowed to take place in terms of the their political systems, who is not. And so we've certainly witnessed recently Myanmar and Burma and the Rohingya Muslims there. Uh, how is that political system in Thailand and Burma, largely Buddhist states? Most people, when they think Buddhism, for example, they think uh, attrition much more about peace and justice. Um, coming from various elements, just seeing the religious elements of Buddhism, but what's the relationship with Buddhism and politics in states like Thailand, in states like Myanmar or formerly Burma, uh, in which there's this close relationship uh, between Buddhism and the state, and what do Buddhists and monks do when they see, in fact, other religions, in the case of Myanmar, the Rohingya Muslims being persecuted, being forced out, some would argue ethnocide uh, going on itself. The same situation in China where the argument is that in fact there's been various ethnocide going on with a certain group within the Muslim pop population. So comparative politics then, as I mentioned to some, is that there are various regions in which these particular states come from democratic traditions to compare those and then there's political perspectives from different regions of the world which see the whole democratic process as a problem itself and they uh, do their politics very very differently and so when we enter the field of comparative politics it's always important to know are we comparing within an ideological system and the differences within that, or are we comparing totally different ideological systems and the political structures that exist as a result of those systems themselves? So we'll be talking a little bit about that as we move onward in our readings and in comparative politics.